right. Thank you very much, Matthew, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Tanvi, also for inviting and, and organizing this. Let me just quickly share my screen. So I go first, and then I will hand over to Marcus. I think that's the, that's the sequence uh, we discussed. Um, let's go. OK. So I assume you can see my presentation. Uh, if not, uh, call out. Thank you very much. Um, so powering the city, we're really excited to start our module, our share in the Future Cities Lab global, um, global uh, as a, I would say, continuation of the work we did in Singapore in the FCL one and two. And we're in this, this case, especially excited to have this team on board. So with us today is also Markus Schlepfer from NTU in Singapore. And uh, in our module team, we also have collaborators from NUS, uh, Professor Fu Yuming, Professor Xiang Tianfu, and Alexander Holberg from Chalmers University, as well as Roger Bolshauser, he's an architect, and Professor at ETH in Zurich. And of course, with us uh, already our team module coordinator, Christoph Weibel, and Justin McCarty as a PhD student. Collaborators, um, we intend to collaborate, and we, this has already started with. Uh, public entities, in this case, the Amt für Städtebau in Zurich, as well as the URA and BCA potentially in Singapore. So I think um, we have a, a quite complete setup to tackle this aspect of powering the city, of upscaling um, the supply using building integrated photovoltaics. And I will give you a short introduction what we intend to do. So this is a, a slide everyone probably knows, or the, the, the base information everyone uh, knows more or less. Um, this is just an update on the numbers. So we learned uh, uh, just last year about the contribution of buildings. And again, the numbers have risen. That is a little depressing. So right now we are talking about 38% of global greenhouse gas emissions associated to buildings, their operation and construction, which uh, of course is devastating. And if you look to the right, we see we had a plateau um, in yeah, the, the last four or five years, or beginning four or five years of this decade. And now we have an increase again. And why this happens is quite clear. We all know that the amount of housing, the amount of buildings that are built uh, is, is sharply increasing due to global growth. And all the benefits we have by increasing efficiency and reducing demand are eaten up by rebound effects, by increase of floor space, uh, and buy more buildings that we build. So I'm a little bit skeptical about where we can go in terms of increasing efficiency if I see this rebound. And I think we probably have to think more about, okay, how do we change? How do we change systematically towards different forms of energy? And, and this is on the, on the positive end. We see what is happening in terms of photovoltaics. We see the accumulative growth of PV capacity on the left. So an exponential growth of installations of photovoltaics globally. Uh, and we see to the right the learning curve and the cost associated. So within 10 years, photovoltaics, electricity uh, generated from photovoltaics has uh, fallen from being one of the most expensive sources of energy to one of the cheapest. And we see in many places, including uh, Singapore, that photovoltaics has become cost competitive, if not the cheapest form. What is also interesting is that we see that no other source, no other fossil source has this learning curve and this rate. Uh, on the country, it's actually increasing in costs. And if you go by economics, then it's quite clear that photovoltaics from the capacity that we have and from an economics point of view will be quite uh, a, a future outlook of our energy systems. Photovoltaics is sometimes criticized um, uh, about, of course, it also has an impact. We have to create those modules. We have to create the electronics and um, used to have quite an impact, but there's the, the second learning curve in terms of carbon emissions related to photovoltaic cells. And this is the latest information we got actually end of last year. Um, in general, there's a, a, a very nice synergy what is happening with the building stock in terms of electricity. So we see an increase of cooling demand due to climate change, also here in, in moderate climate zones. We see that heating can be done very efficiently using heat pumps as a technology. But we also see an increase of efficient compression chillers. So it means using electricity to generate heat and cold um, is a, a, a very efficient source of doing so. We see a rise of electric mobility um, that, of course, plays into um, the linking of buildings and mobility. And we see um, an, an a rise of electric appliances. So I think it's fair to say that the building and mobility sector will be transforming to electricity. And the question is, what is faster? Is it the decarbonization of our electrical grids 
Oasis, the decarbonization of the decentralized energy that we can generate by photovoltaics. And this is what's shown on the right. This is the, the latest numbers on the decrease of the carbon content, the embedded carbon emissions of the most uh, widespread photovoltaic technology, uh, monocrystalline silicium cells. And we see that over the past 10 years, we have seen a decrease of 60% of carbon content. Um, and that leads to an energy, primary energy payback time of a little bit more than a year. So operating those mm -hmm. systems um, has become very, very efficient and very low carbon. And that's an interesting perspective. So why should we do this on buildings? We personally think um, cities will be in the center of this energy development. We already know today that roughly 80% of energy is consumed in urban areas. And what is nice about cities is that in principle, a lot of surfaces are available, right? You don't need further sealing of land. You don't need to use um, agricultural land. In Switzerland, for example, that is not even allowed. We can see synergies with other building measures, for example, to increase efficiency. If you combine renewable energy generation with um, um, retrofit, for example, there's an interesting synergy here. And of course, there's a, a spatial relation, right? The, the way how we use energy in a city, the way how we might store it, um, and the different dynamics. There is a synergy between creating energy on site and then using it in different applications directly on site. And this is also because it helps us to relieve uh, the networks, the grids behind that are actually not, in many places, not capable, to capable of taking large amounts of electricity. So in this sense, we can also have uh, yeah, an efficient way uh, of yeah, transforming the entire energy grid. The challenges, of course, are also clear. Um, mainly it's on the economics. Uh, so for Switzerland, there's been studies showing that also building integrated photovoltaics can be cost effective. But of course, um, the specific integration into buildings leads to additional cost. Um, and of course, the questions of integration and acceptance, uh, we, ha we have not been used to seeing these type of installations. But I will show you at the end that there's also new opportunities on the horizon in terms of designing them differently and maybe to also increase or improve the aesthetics of these systems in cities. So that's kind of the backdrop. Um, the Future Cities Lab Global allows us to investigate this and uh, deliberately in this interdisciplinary team. And I very much subscribe to the theme of FCL about sustainable cities and settlements through science by design in place and time. I think if we talk about cities, we also need to talk about the place and the time dimension, especially if we think about reducing carbon emissions. So the places for us uh, are two cities, Zurich and Singapore. Um, both are representative of a certain type of city in Zurich, of course, in a moderate climate, um, in um, a lower or medium density, I would say. Um, versus Singapore as an example of a highly dense tropical city with a lot of mixed use development. So we intend to do research on those two cities as examples. We intend to reach out to um, planning and, and governmental entities to understand the interactions. And what comes uh, very positively is that both cities have heavily committed to actually doing something. So Switzerland has pledged to be climate, oh not Switzerland, sorry, Zurich has pledged uh, to be climate neutral by 2040. Um, and they have quite ambitious goals, how they want to transform the city in this direction. And also, if we look at an entire scale of Switzerland, there's approximations that potentially 45% of the electricity of Switzerland could be generated on buildings. Now, if you look into uh, Singapore, then there's also with a new green plan, there's ambitious goals, how to transform the, the built environments, how to have uh, a pathway towards decarbonization. And this also includes, for example, the quadrupling of solar energy deployment. And if you look at the latest Singapore roadmap for PV, it states that in, in an accelerated scenario, it could lead between 22 and 43% of solar contribution to the electric power demand. So it also has been recognized that there's a significant potential of switching to solar. So Zurich and Singapore will, use, will be our use cases. The scale we're investigating is uh, what we call the district envelope. So buildings, just single buildings, tend to be too limited. We, we are clear that, especially with respect to energy systems, we have to look beyond the single building, look at the connection of multiple buildings. However, looking at the entire city is too complex and too abstract. So what we, we decide or what we're mostly interested in is this, this district envelope, the district scale. 
because this is where different things are combined, for example, building fabric, uh, the services for generation, not only on buildings, but also on infrastructure, energy systems, decentralized energy systems, aspects of the environment, global uh, local warming, well, urban heat island in this sense, but also occupant and user behavior and the link to mobility. So a lot of things are combined on this district scale. That makes it very interesting for investigation. So now module we've kind of three core work packages that try to address those different aspects. And by the choice of people in this module and by their expertise, we try to really get a holistic picture of this upscale. So what do we need to know for upscale? First, we need to get better in terms of realistic energy yields in dense urban settings. That's a technical question. But if you think about shadowing, if you think about uh, vegetation, if you think about certain building configurations, um, it's quite clear that we need to be realistic, not only in rooftops, but also in facades, what the forecast could be dependent on the choice of different technologies. As mentioned, one of the challenges is uh, economics, cost, as well as life cycle. So we have to come up and investigate cost and life cycle effective solutions. How can we, for example, combine the retrofit of building facades and rooftops with solar energy generation? And there we see very interesting uh, benefits and synergies. On the systems, on the energy system side, the question is how can we utilize this uh, energy best? Um, so, for example, by the district uh, and district energy systems in place, but also by the design of districts. So, which use combinations um, is the potential for shaving uh, certain peaks or for shifting certain demands? And of course, linking the generation to these kind of storage and energy conversion systems allows us to more flexibly balance, because at the end, one of the technical challenges is, of course, the intermittency and the stochasticity of uh, solar generation that we somewhat have to tackle. Also linked to electric mobility is interesting on this district scale. From the side of uh, socioeconomics, the question is, of course, what are drivers and barriers? What are criteria for acceptance that will probably be very different if we look in Singapore as compared to Zurich. And then, of course, what is the impact of policy and regulation on this entire setting? So how, on the user end, can we actually um, facilitate an acceptance and an upscale of these type of technologies? These are the core questions. Unfortunately, we don't start at zero. So in the next few slides, I give you a little background on what we did in the Future Cities Lab 2. Um, and the preceding work, very fortunately, for example, we start with a, a quite interesting package of analytical tools. One of them is the City Energy Analyst, um, which has become a, a quite um, a comprehensive tool and, and a modeling environment for urban energy systems modeling, including the buildings and building characteristics and energy systems with a special focus on solar and solar assessment, um, but also including links to, for example, uh, energy supply optimization, but also, for example, to microclimatic models, as we did in, in cooling Singapore. Um, and currently, and that is interesting, we're discussing a link to, to larger scale models. So, for example, going from this district and urban scale to national scale and looking how we can combine those different model granularities. So that's kind of a, a workhorse we've, we've done a lot of work with. In the past, in FCL2, we've also investigated uh, about those crucial parameters. And one crucial parameter is the land use mix and the urban density. So of course, dependent on the density you plan, so the, the floor area ratio and the use mix you put in place, it is possible to reach certain shares of renewable energy. You can see, dependent on how you kind of uh, take a perspective, if you start at renewable energy shares, then it's quite clear in combination with a certain density, so the floor area ratio, you can only choose a certain mix of uses to actually achieve this share of supply by renewable energies. And, and that's actually quite interesting because normally you get this to the left, you get, get a certain use distribution and you get a certain density, but this often doesn't match with the targets. For example, a, a, a city sets themselves for carbon reduction um, because by design, it is not possible to actually achieve those because demands tend to be too high or the percentage of renewable energy might be too low. So this interaction is quite interesting. And then if we look further, this is also work from FCL2, um, where we investigated certain vernacular typologies, uh, in this case uh, from Singapore. And then um, it was the creation of a basically a generating script that would allow to, to generate a typical archetypical district and to investigate 
the renewable energy potential of those configurations. So you see here, these are 13 different uh, distinct typologies randomly assembled on this, this kind of virtual district. And then if you compare the generation on those surfaces um, with the generation or with the, the carbon emissions of the grid, then you can see, okay, what could you actually achieve first? At what radiation threshold would it make sense to actually place photovoltaics? You see, this is very dependent on the carbon emission of the grid you're looking at. Um, but for example, in Singapore, you can say um, every surfaces that receives an annual solar radiation above maybe 200, 250 kilowatt hours is on a life cycle aspect beneficial as compared if you would take the electricity from the grid. Then if you look into the different typologies, it's quite interesting. First of all, how much could you offset uh, from carbon emissions of the operation of buildings? And what is the percentage of facade area that would actually be covered by photovoltaics? And there we get indications about more suitable block typologies and the interdependencies of these block typologies and solar uh, placement. Next, of course, the link to the energy system is essential. So this is a study we're currently doing with a Swiss mobility provider. It's, it's uh, very much in the making. But the idea here is to think about and, and link solar energy generation on a station building and basically a, a radius of 50 or 100 meters around the station building two offerings for electric mobility, so individual cars, as well as electrical buses. And it's a quite interesting game of balancing generation potential and demand very obviously, and this is basically depicted down here. So different combinations of building radii and services uh, with different electric mobility offers lead to a certain amount of demands, but also increasing radii leads to a certain increase of generation potential. So there's an interesting question, what should we actually combine? What, what are synergetic uh, mixes and uses? And then, of course, the time dimension is quite essential. You see the strong differences between the winter mode and the summer mode. In, in Switzerland, of course, there's a big, big gap. In, in winter, we're struggling to get basically this um, time-based overlap uh, on generation and demand, whereas in summer, we have a much, much overshoot of generation potential. And that, that, of course, highlights the question of storage, the scale of storage. But also in this case, we could see that using electric vehicles as intermittent storage is promising. But we need to much better understand how people would actually use that. And there, at this point of the energy systems, is where the user and understanding the user comes in. This is what uh, Markus Schlepfer will introduce uh, in the next presentation. So a better understanding of the human occupant and user will allow us to design systems differently and to better utilize renewable energy in place. Then we zoom in. Um, of course, at the end, we're also interested in buildings. We need to bridge those different scales. And then of course, the question is, how would that actually work? What would be constructions? What would be combinations in the city of photovoltaics? You see, these are three vertical examples of very different kinds. Um, this is by Renzo Piano, which has this, uh, takes into account that yes, it's a vertical building and we actually harness better on tilted surfaces. But this is, for example, a retrofit project in Switzerland, which very seamlessly integrates a photovoltaic generation on the facade. And this is even a full solar facade in Basel in Switzerland, which doesn't look like a solar facade at all. It actually looks like um, a very normal and standard facade, but it's a fully producing solar facade. So the question, if we go down to the district envelope to the building, how would we do that? And then we, we zoom in, and this is what we do with Alexander Holberg. We zoom into, okay, from a life cycle perspective, what are optimal positioning and placements? So of course, if we look closely, the, the grid, the emissions of the grid is not a static uh, number, but it fluctuates, especially in, in Switzerland, where you have a high share of renewables in summer and a lesser share in winter. And then if you look at this from a dynamic perspective, this is one building entirely covered in Zurich, uh, right, quite close to my house um, in photovoltaics. So this is a full photovoltaic building. But then you can see dependent on this fluctuation, the placement of certain panels, first of all, you have a different solar yield, that's to be expected, but also the payback years <laughs> quite heavily from, from a very short time to a very long time, very dependent on the time and the amount of radiation um, that is received on those different surfaces. So this is the building scale. And then last but not least, we want to think about um, exploration of also acceptance and, and architectural potential. This is what we do with the students and just uh, to, to close this off, this is a, a solar design workshop we just did this March uh, with students of our integrated building systems master as well as with uh, architecture students. 
And there we let them loose on, on treating solar as a material. And I think this is the key. It's, it's everyone in his mind has this kind of clunky aluminum uh, solar modules and panels, but we're way beyond that. We can use solar as a material, as an active material. And the students showed very nicely how they could do that. Some students even explored questions of uh, recycling. So taking actually shattered um, solar cells and combining them to new cells or looking into different colorings and, and different uh, aesthetic uh, interpretations of it. Um, so just as an example, they didn't only just design, they also measured and they also looked, okay, what would the efficiency be of such a cell and what would you actually achieve? And I think this is quite interesting. Starting to work with solar as a material I think especially on the architectural side opens up a new level of opportunities and these are some examples just very quickly flipping through what then came out of it so very different solar solutions all all functional uh, all interesting and with architectural integration potential so this is um i'm already coming to to my end so working hypothesis for the entire module is that we think that urban bipv can and must make a significant contribution. The surfaces and, and areas are there, but we need to find out what are low cost and low embedded carbon uh, solutions, ideally synergetic with other measures. We need to think about the flexibility in placement and utilization, and of course the integration in current and future decentralized energy systems. And storage and mobility will be a key. And for storage and mobility, we need to understand explicitly how people use the city this is where Marcus comes in now. Then, of course, understanding the movement and the behavior of people also includes understanding the drivers and barriers. So why do people decide for certain systems? What are boundary conditions of their decision making? And then last but not least, with students, we, we try to explore also using this approach solar as material, finding new ways for designing them and, and increasing the acceptance. I think we just as a society need to shift our perception how we see the city and see the city in, in a way that we, we see aesthetic and cultural uh, valuable integrations of solar into our cities and we, we cherish that they're actually around instead of getting disturbed by them. So that's, that's kind of the overarching. All right, um, thanks very much. Uh, that's it for my end. And um, I don't know how we handle this. I think uh, uh, Marcus goes next and then afterwards we do the questions. Okay, so I think then I will take over. So thank you very much, Arno. Uh, I think it was a fantastic overview of the overall project. And uh, what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes, perhaps, is just to um, uh, dive a little bit deeper into the uh, demand-driven modeling of, of how we can use uh, new types of data to better understand how people make use of the city, which is then used for uh, a better estimating needs for electricity demands and storage and so on. So let me try to share the, uh, the screen. Um, Uh, I think I got a problem because it's recording. Um, let me see, let me try again, sorry for that. Now it could work. All right, can you see my screen already? My, okay, fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. Uh, okay, uh, just... Yeah. Okay, so here it is, I hope so, at least. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, Orno uh, Schlieter has already given a very nice introduction to the overall project and also how the uh, uh, more data-driven approach is coming in into this entire project. Uh, just perhaps to uh, briefly uh, recap, 
um, the problem statement here at the um, um, for the integration of the in, uh, intermittent renewables, especially photovoltaics, is really that we have uh, in some locations across the city we have mismatches between uh, photovoltaic generation potential and demand, and so this is a worsening. Also, if we increase uh, the share of photovoltaics in certain uh, uh, locations. So one example is this um, California duck curve I was just uh, learning about. Uh, and so the, uh, the problem here is basically that in the eve, especially in the evening hours when the sun is going down, the people are coming home and are ramping up their energy demand, which gives a, a big mismatch. Uh, between production and demand in the evening hours. So we have these local imbalances, which are completely different in residential areas, but uh, compared to more uh, uh, CBD areas, for instance. Uh, the second development uh, is the uh, penetration of the electric vehicles. And so electric vehicles, they, first of all, they change demand profiles in location, different locations across space and also in time. But at the same time, as Arno already uh, mentioned, electric vehicles also constitute a storage device. So they are able to transport stored energy from one location of the city into the other. And third, coming uh, more from the city side, cities in itself, they're also becoming more complex in terms of how they are organized in terms of centers and sub-centers. So where do people go with their electric vehicles? Where do they need uh, energy demands at different locations at different times? And um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is also the increasing digitalization which has been clearly accelerated through the uh, COVID situation. So for instance, more people are working from home. Um, online shopping is increasing, has been accelerated and so on. And that also leads to shifts uh, in the electricity, in the local electricity demand if people are staying more in the uh, residential areas, for instance. So there are all these developments and that uh, are of course increasing the, the complexity and the challenge of uh, having adequate demand models, which are so important for, uh, for estimating uh, the need for photovoltaics and, and storage capabilities. And so that's basically the challenge, but on the, on the positive side, we have more and more data available, actually how people make use uh, of a city. And here is where the uh, data-driven modeling seems to be quite promising for us. So we can really, first of all, measure the pulls of the city uh, based on different types of data, like mobile phone data is a prominent example, but there are other types of data, data transportation data, um, and uh, or like the uh, um, <clears throat> Google activity data, for instance. So there's a, a, an increasing wealth of data around that we can harness to better understand how people make use of the city. Um, then we can develop models, uh, flow models, and from that uh, we can develop energy demand models. And what's also interesting is to um, look into inadvertent developments. For instance, if you have special events during certain days that make the uh, make the for the local forecasting of the uh, energy demand quite challenging. And uh, so we have more data, but on the other side, on the other side, we also have made. Um, uh, good, um, um, <clears throat> good advances in the in the modeling approaches. So, for instance, in the complexity, science has has really provided us with tools to model such complex systems as cities. Uh, and the second development is certainly machine learning, uh, which seems to be very adequate actually to really learn which factors play a role in the flows of people, and then eventually also in the energy demand. And so what we can do is with, with the mobile phone data, just to give you a few examples, maybe that are more tangible. Uh, so first of all, we can really measure flows from location between different locations. They are called so-called or they are so-called origin destination flows. So for each hour, for instance, we can really measure how many people uh, are moving from location I to location B. And so we can do this across the entire city. We can really identify uh, activity centers during uh, different 
during different times of the day, over the week, and also how they vary uh, over different months, for instance. So this already gives quite, um, quite a solid uh, empirical basis. And we can then really use this, um, this, this knowledge of the whereabouts of people to really um, uh, uh, plan infrastructures. And um, so we have done this in the past already um, in, <clears throat> by applying this, this framework to developing countries. I mean, developing countries are an interesting case because uh, the electricity infrastructure is not as well developed yet, of course, as in Singapore, for instance. But on the other hand, almost everybody carries a mobile phone, a mobile phone and so the mobile phone towers, which are scattered all over the country, which are the blue dots here, they constitute like sensors basically of where people are at which times. And so this gives us really the, the spatial distribution of the people over time. And we can compare this in locations where uh, that are electrified. We can compare this with the electricity demand. And what we have seen here in Senegal is that the electricity demand correlates uh, very well with the mobile phone activity. And so the mobile phone activity really gives you, um, gives you a, a quantity of how much electricity is needed in those locations that are not electrified yet. And so with, the, um, <clears throat> with mobile phone data, you can also go one step further and you can start to, to model actually what will happen once you electrify a location. And this is also, uh, what we have we have done here and what could also be done then further in, in, in this project for a developed city is how different uh, locations will develop in the future uh, due to urban planning, but also due to digitalization and so on. And what we have seen here in Senegal is that, for instance, uh, once you electrify an area, this really increases trips to that, more people are coming from the outside. And this is something you need to consider when planning uh, infrastructures. And so um, <clears throat> we could then use basically this knowledge of the whereabouts of people to decide which uh, electrification option is, is the most technically and economically feasible. And so for instance, we have here PV and microgrid technologies, and we could basically then decide for each uh, point in space, which technology is the most uh, appropriate one. And uh, so this is also a, a project that has been ongoing then in the, uh, during the Future Cities Lab too. So this is basically just to give you an idea of how we can couple this, this flow data to the energy consumption data. And so we have, uh, we, or we did some little steps also in, in, inside developed cities. Um, so here, we used a, a case study in, in Trento where we had both mobile phone data and energy demand data. And we also could see that in certain regions of the urban region of the, of the urban area, uh, especially the city centers, there is a, a very strong correlation between the presence of people and the uh, uh, presence uh, and the energy demand. And so this helped us then again to developed um, to develop uh, short-term forecasting models for the city, but just what happens over the next hour, uh, which is then important for, um, or could be useful for um, uh, special events, um, <clears throat> cases like, you know, what happens during vacations and so on. And so past research number three. So this here, I just wanted to mention uh, again, what um, Orno, Orno's group, Orno Schlöter's group has been doing during FCL2. Uh, there are other types of data like uh, Google um, activity um, data, popular times data in different buildings and different amenities. Uh, so for instance, mobile phone data is uh, of course quite coarse grain. So it's mostly at cell tower level also to provide uh, or to maintain data privacy. And so different data sets can be combined. For instance, we can combine mobile phone data with uh, popular times data from Google to have a more fine-grained picture of the energy demands in even at the building level. So, um, so this was just to give you an idea 
um, of this coupling between the uh, between mobility data and energy uh, usage data, and so um, we we really so these are the next steps here, and we really um, think it's it's quite promising also for developed cities like Singapore and Zurich, especially uh, if we look at different scenarios where we have high penetration of electric vehicles, also where it's really becoming important to understand the flows of people in cities. Yeah, I think that's it uh, from my side. Um, I think uh, I, I either give back to, to Arno or to Tonvi or, or Matthew. Excellent, thank you so much. This is brilliant. So who would like to open out the questions or comments? Please go ahead and unmute yourself and jump in. Eric, well, I, I, I actually I actually do have a question to both you, uh, Arno and Marcus. Is when I look at this one, I'm very impressed. You know, and kind of shocked to see that 38 percent of the emission carbon emission comes from the buildings. Um, looking around the world, you know, I still believe we have a lot of buildings which are very poorly insulated, and we lose a lot of energy. And you know, my gut feeling actually tells me that uh, we have much more saving potential, improved insulation, um, actually than actually you know adding new energy to to be just wasted through the walls and the windows and the roofs. So interested, is that a point that you are going to consider at all in this whole study? Because you know, powering the city also means maybe reduce the power consumption. No, oh, definitely. I mean, um, and obviously that depends very much on the context where you are. So in our climate zone, insulating buildings uh, works quite well. At the end, it's a, it's a question of balance also on the timeline. So what, where basically do you invest in, right? Is it reduction of energy demand versus um, the production of clean energy? And if you look at this on the timeline, and if you look at the time we have left, basically, we want to decarbonize and we want to reduce uh, global warming uh, to, to a threshold, then of course we need to be very careful what we spend our carbon budget on. So I think for, for both it needs a, a life cycle perspective, so you need to think, okay, in this case, in this climate and in this building typology, it makes sense to reduce about this amount and then the rest maybe I generate by electricity. So we see it very much as synergies. So that, that's what I was trying to highlight, of course, we need to reduce energy demand, for example, in a Swiss context. Otherwise, we will not be able to transition to all renewable energies because the energy demand is just too high. So ideally, it is a combination of reducing energy demand. For example, let's assume we place photovoltaics on a facade. Why not think about facade elements that do both increase the installation rate, reduce thermal losses, and produce electric energy on site? Right? So these are the type of synergies that at the end are interesting. So both ways, in an extreme way, will be difficult, but we need synergetic combinations of both. And yeah, maybe to, to clarify, I'm not worried about Scandinavia or Germany or Switzerland. So most of the EU countries I'm not worried about. What I would really target on is I see a huge energy waste in the whole climatized area around the world, the Middle East, as an example, you know, I mean, if you just will put a, a an insulation every all the flat roofs and a little bit more modern AC conditions, you could dramatically reduce the energy waste there because cooling energy is about two and a half to three times more than heating energy, as you are very well aware of. The United That's States true. has a huge problem, I think, particularly in the hotter areas. And then the whole um, uh, former USSR and Russia, uh, where it's very cold, but uh, we also know that because of subsidized gas and oil, it's you're smiling, Arno. <laughs> no, it's, you already indicated that there's a lot of interdependencies on those choices. So in, in the tropics, uh, um, I would agree. But for example, in the tropics, it's actually not that much insulation because the temperature difference between the inside and the outside is actually not that big to reduce those thermal losses. It's much more shading. It's much more protection from the sun and utilizing, for example, natural ventilation measures to reduce the amount of AC systems that are in place. But it's, it's a very multifaceted problem. I mean, it needs to be in place and we need to understand what are the different cultural contexts that we need to to address and it's there's no there's not no such thing as a single solution and for for the, the swiss context it's clearly a very different setup than in in singapore or in any tropical area which obviously goes very closely also rethinking the way how we cool buildings this is what we've done in fcl2 
uh, and FCL1 uh, come up with more efficient ways of cooling. Um, so these need to be integrated in those retrofit measures or in these construction measures that we think. Thank you. Super. Thank you, Eric. I see we've got three questions lined up. It looks like Stephen and Luis, and then we've got Kang Jidong. Please, Stephen, go ahead. Hi. Um, thanks, Arno. Thanks, Marcus. Really exciting to be reminded of what you've been doing and also making the roadmap for what's to come. It's very exciting. Um, I have something just quite specific. I've always found your work to be very respectful of the architecture. In other words, you're always thoughtful about you know how to attach this technology to the, the, the sort of public space of the building and the aesthetic dimensions and so on. Um, and I'm my wonder. I'm wondering whether you're in a way being too respectful. So in other words, I'm wondering whether um, this concept of the district envelope is very interesting, and whether you would investigate in a way moderate changing or designing that envelope a little bit more to match your your criteria. And I, I got a, there's a couple of examples. One, of course, comes from your own work where you start to wrinkle the facade in order to increase the surface area. So that's a kind of interesting in a way, uh, it, it's, it's optimized around um, solar energy generation. And an older idea to do with kind of solar tracking. Are, the, are the, either of these ideas um, still relevant or do you just, you regard them as, as not appropriate and that you would want to kind of operate within an existing aesthetic um, uh, sort of language, if you like? No, that's, that's a very important point. I mean, what we see is that and, and that's what I mentioned at the very end. It's uh, funny enough, people and, and also decision makers on the public and uh, this question of integration and expression becomes very pressing. We all know that there's technical benefits from that, but if I talk to the city um, and I've talked to stakeholders, also private people, then it's, it hinges very much about integration and aesthetics and cultural acceptance of these measures. I think we're in a transition phase towards maybe new forms of expression. So. What I hope and what we do here with students also is that we can define use new, for, new forms of expression that would gradually shift the perception of those photovoltaic systems in cities. Um, and the measures that you mentioned or the, the options that you mentioned, I think these are in, they're all very interesting, right? Slanting, for example, in a tropical context, slanting uh, facades to have more exposure uh, to the to a horizontal direction or even using tracking devices. I think we need to investigate these new options and and very on a, on a very good end i think the last uh, two three years have seen an a, a really an explosion of different options to design solar in a different way so i think that helps us to make or to progress in this type of of uh, aesthetics and then acceptance of something so at the end my my wish would be that it becomes a no-brainer that someone creates an energy generating facade because the boxes are ticked and it just makes sense from a cost perspective as well from an aesthetics point of view this is why for example we have roger bolzhauser as a designer on board who who actively works with with designing and constructing and building those buildings and, and the sparing and feedback with him will be very, very interesting there's other points of this district envelope i don't think where we need to be such so sensitive like infrastructures or industrial complexes there we i think we can very boldly go for the most cost effective way of solar installations um, that's very clear. I think we, we need to distinguish in this district envelope what we're actually looking at. But the bottom line, I think, is we need to train our sense of aesthetics and, and our perception of the city to integrate these type of systems in, in, in future cities. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Luis Santos, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Thank you, Arno, and thank you, Marcus, for the presentation. I think it was very clear and interesting. Uh, I, I think this was a bit discussed already uh, when you talk like about the like having each building type or district type uh, fitting a cord going to a certain technology. But I would be more in, uh, interested to, to hear a bit more about uh, how do you perceive uh, the solar panel integration in the high dense uh, and high rise areas, especially in cities like Singapore, where it can have from 10 to 60 floors, like very high, and then a solar panel on the roof would supply like very minimal amount compared to what this building is consuming. And then the integration with the facade may be very limited because of the shading that the buildings are providing on each other. So you see more like uh, we have to see the city as a whole 
uh, for that. And for some areas, maybe the solar integration is not uh, optimal, but for the city itself, uh, it, it's, it's a good system. Or you still see another way that like uh, even those commercial areas, which are usually the ones consuming more uh, electricity as well, there's another way. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, we need to really look at the, at the different contexts. In, in Singapore, for example, they just um, adapted the solar roadmap by realizing that actually the roof area is much less than they expected because we have those conflicts with void decks, uh, AC systems, uh, swimming pools, all those different things, roof gardens, right? We're in, in constant battle with urban farming and urban gardening that, of course, wants to grow tomatoes on rooftops versus we want to generate electricity. We, we know that there's interesting combinations of that. Um, so that, that is very clear. Um, for this, we are, we are starting a collaboration with Adrian Gert Regame, who's looking at ecosystem services. And I think that will be interesting. But, but um, on the facade side, so with this one example, I try to highlight that with, with a dropping carbon content of photovoltaic modules, even surfaces that have non-optimal solar irradiation become on a life cycle perspective competitive or even beneficial. Right. So even if you have an area on a high rise building that only receives four or 500 kilowatt hours per square meter in a year, given the drop in the learning curve of PV cells, that can be beneficial to harness this electricity as compared to taking it from the electric grid. But of course, that is context, context specific and context dependent. Um, how much we can actually get on those facades, this is actually this is one question we're looking into um, also in this, this module. And looking obviously for opportunities is, is key, right? If we have industrial, if we have commercial areas with large horizontal services, those are still, those are basically no brainers, right? We, we can do this already today. But how we do this on the vertical will be very interesting. Singapore is interesting because yes, it's dense, but the building's actually quite spaced, right? And given the very vertical angle of the sun that oscillates around the, the, um, the center line just a little bit, the shading is actually not that bad as you would imagine, right? If, if the Singapore buildings would be in Zurich and we have very low sun angles, then it would be much more dramatic. Um, so I was surprised to see in this preliminary studies that there's actually a significant potential. And this has been um, uh, confirmed by the uh, PV pathway of Singapore that actually yields a significant potential on those vertical surfaces. But this is a challenge, right? Um, Another challenge that is related to that is, okay, how can we design these facades in a way that they don't contribute to urban heat, for example, um, and, and, and don't have detrimental side effects? I think these are open questions we need to look at. But I, I believe that with the drop of, of carbon content uh, and, and the options we have for architectural design, we can also realize this on vertical facades in a cost-efficient way. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. We've got four questions lined up on the chat. We've got uh, Kang Jidong first. You want to go ahead and ask your question, please? Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Ar uh, Arno, uh, for the presentation. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, I'm quite interested in a topic you mentioned about. And the question I want to ask is related to the space. And as we know, uh, Singapore is a high density city. So even though we use up all the available space, maybe the solar PV cannot uh, 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 support all the power in Singapore. So how do you consider the perspective of the space saving in your, uh, in your study? What strategy can you use? Uh, I, I, I noticed that you combine the solar PV installation with some building architecture. So how, what space uh, strategy do you use to save the space, like to decide the proper location of the solar PV and we're using set, uh, energy sharing to save space? Do you have this kind of consideration? Thank you. So saving space, if, if I'm correct, you mean by otherwise placing them on the ground or some reservoirs or some, some natural uh, environments or which, which space do you refer to in terms of saving? Uh, I mean, refers to the building like commercial not like like the residential building like mm. rooftop or mm. facade yes mm. yeah i believe that there's significant potential on on the rooftop as well as on the facades and utilizing these surfaces for for both combining potentially retrofit with with solar energy generation and doing that um, 
I mean, you're, you're completely right. There, unfortunately, in this whole energy discussion, there's no silver bullet. There's not one solution that will do everything. So it needs to be a combination. And solar can only reach a certain share, but it can reach a significant share uh, also in a, in a Singaporean context. So I think we should utilize the potential we have from, from solar PV because our future energy systems will be a mix from very different sources and options that we need to utilize. Um, otherwise, we won't make this transition. This is in Switzerland very similarly. So what, what I would advocate is that even in a city of Singapore to identify the services on buildings and infrastructure, for example, walkways, covered walkways, commercial um, uh, bus stations, identify uh, the potential and the solar yield with it and then mix it and, and match it with appropriate technology to utilize the solar generation there. For example, in, in a building context, I see many buildings at least in the higher regions of a building um, and of course the fraction of the rooftop as being potential active services for generation. And by this, my hope, for example, in, in Switzerland, it's not possible to just put huge solar arrays in nature. This is just not allowed. And people would also protest against that. It takes 15 years to plant one windmill um, just because people are very concerned about the aesthetics and about the impact of those systems. So for me, the most I would say feasible way of reaching a high share of renewables is actually by integrating photovoltaics into the building services that we have. Okay. Okay, the sharing and the sharing between uh, between different buildings. The sharing, you mean sharing of electricity? Uh, yes. yes. Share the, yeah. So, so what is what is interesting? I mean, there's uh, there's very interesting potentials between different buildings to to kind of match certain loads in generation. And yes. for example, Switzerland has been very powerful to allow the sharing of electricity across a group of buildings. And then it spawned actually new business models where, where uh, contractors went out and said, look, we will rent your roof services. We will build a PV array. We will sell this electricity to your tenants and we will sell the rest on the market. So everyone has a win situation. It all, almost yeah. sounds too good to be true, but it's interesting that these combinations spark new business models and new business ideas. And, and we, I think we can influence that by designing our urban spaces in a way that they can benefit from these models. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kang. If I could, we've got three uh, more questions lined up for the next six minutes. So just briefly as a follow-up question to what you just discussed, Arno, could you speak briefly to the distinction between the polycrystalline, monocrystalline, and uh, thin film in terms of what's developing most suitable for integration? Obviously, these are integrated in different ways, right? Right. Um, yeah, we see a, a huge success of monocrystalline silicium in both efficiency uh, and, and, and cost. So this, this has become the, the dominant uh, technology that is around. Um, we still think very much in conventional modules. Uh, they have a glass front cover. They have aluminum framing. Uh, they're rather heavyweight, which is an issue, especially for retrofits. So if you have um, uh, 15, 20 kilos per square meter that you need to put in an existing facade, it's quite a challenge. On the other hand, we see, um, I mean, thin film technologies has been around, but they are suffering from lesser yields. They, they have a better, much better life cycle balance, right? So, so it's uh, almost a no-brainer, but at the end, still it is the kilowatt peak that you can generate with these techniques. What I see on the horizon is, is new materials um, that are promising, perovskites are under discussion, but there's always a question of availability. So how much, what is the raw material and how much would be there available on, on the earth? that speaks in, in, in form, uh, form monocrystalline silicium, which uh, the raw material is very available. And then on the longer end, it's very interesting what can be done in terms of organic solar cells. There's been precedents uh, looking into uh, starch-based organic solar cells that, are, but of course, uh, just have a fraction of the solar yield that is available. So in terms of cost efficiency, the, the, the most feasible solution right now is monocrystalline silicium. Uh, in the current arrangement and then adapting or changing the front cover plates um, uh, to give them, for example, different coloring, different structuring, and there's only a small strain on efficiency. What is interesting arising also for building context is bifacial solar cells, which harness electricity on both sides. So if you think about free floating glass elements, then of course you can use both sides for generating electricity. And these are the, the main applications where I see the biggest potential in building applications. Thank you. Can we have Alberto, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Arno, for the 
uh, nice presentation. And my question is actually two parts. The first one is, in your opinion, what are the main drivers for, you mentioned residential, commercial, and industrial, right? And I guess that for them to decide to install PV system, they may have different uh, reasoning behind, not just economic. So I would like to, to know your opinion on that. And then linked to that is, what do you think the government or the central authorities can do to improve the solar PV adoptions for these sectors? Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, those are two big questions. Um, one really means understanding exactly the motivation. And in, in it, it, I mean, it's, it's manifold, I would say, right? If you look at commercial owners, then there's things like corporate social responsibility and CO2 reduction plans. So companies and, and professional owners try to reduce the carbon emissions of the building stock. This is what we see. So this is a motivation. Very often this goes even across uh, company strategies. So corporate so social responsibility means, okay, reducing carbon emissions on all ends of a company. We had very interesting discussions uh, on that end. For professional owners, they see um, a benefit, uh, as at least in Switzerland, there's a, a take up, uh, or, or I would say, um, a conscience of these type of technologies, and this is associated to a certain value of a property. So you can see that that equipping your building with uh, uh, photovoltaics and solar electricity has an add on and especially addresses, I would say, environmentally conscious people, which is not the entire majority. It's maybe a, a smaller fraction, but it's a growing fraction. So in the last uh, last year, electric vehicles have, actually have been the most sold type of vehicles in, in Switzerland, which is which shows that something is, is flipping. Um, so so for the private owner, it's very often, I would say, the conscience and the and the awareness of climate change, at least in the Swiss context. In, it will be very interesting to investigate this in a Singapore context. We already, with the colleagues from NUS, discussed about what are the different stakeholders we need to address um, and what are their drivers, right? Uh, they, we, we have some blank spots on, on the drivers in the Singaporean context. Um, um, and obviously, um, yeah, addressing, for example, commercial um, condo uh, uh, owners and, and, uh, and operators, as well as maybe governmental entities for for more public housing, for example, in an HDB setting. So this, we still need to find out. Uh, in, in terms of uh, governance and pushing that, there's been different strategies. So Germany has been very successful in increasing the amount of uh, solar installed by uh, using subsidies, uh, providing high feed-in tariffs that has really exploded and has made Germany one of the drivers. They, they subsequently lowered these subsidies um, uh, because they, they, they've seen that it has become <laughs> Uh, a little bit difficult because at the end, of course, all the consumers have to pay for that. In Switzerland, they go for a different model. They, they look more into kind of uh, more business applications. So for example, they have re relaxed the regulations um, until a couple of years, you were only allowed to generate and use your electricity by your own. Now you can couple multiple buildings and you can do exactly what I mentioned, kind of a contracting model uh, and being more economic by scaling up and then selling people this electricity that is generated by photovoltaics and having kind of uh, synergetic business models behind. And, and this is clearly, this is just by the switch of a rule, right? This is uh, by regulation. All of a sudden you could combine buildings across different streets and it immediately spawn new business models. In Singapore, that my, my favorite example is for district cooling, where if you use district cooling, at least when we did this research, you were allowed to have a, a, a higher floor area ratio in your building. So you could actually build more space if you would supply it in a more environmental friendly way. And these are the type of leverages I think that can be very powerful. Thank you. Super. We are in fact at the end of our time, but we've got three more questions lined up. So Arno, Marcus, can I put it to you? Do you prefer to stay on for a couple more minutes or do we want to respond to these questions uh, via email or something like that? As you prefer. Well, we can go for a couple of more minutes. Oh, that's okay, great. So for those of you who have to leave, thank you so much for joining. We hope that we've lost a few people already, but we've still got the majority. So for those of you who can stay, please do. Just so you know, for the, those who do have to leave, the next um, overture will be on the dense and green cities. So this will be great. After Professor Schluter and Schlapfer, we have Professor Schrupfer and uh, Mentz next time around. So you'll be receiving an invitation for that. So thank you for joining. For those of you who can stay, please, let's continue. We've got next a question from Reza Mokhtari.
Hello, Arno, and thank you for your representation for presentation. Uh, I have a short question, and that is, uh, have you considered uh, novel cooling technologies uh, such as radiative cooling or heating technologies like uh, solar collectors besides the photovoltaics to, uh, you know, provide the heating and cooling energy besides the electricity, or you just consider district heating and cooling, and you just uh, want to, you know, uh, implement the rooftop photovoltaics. And I mean, uh, have you considered those those novel technologies or what? What is that? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for your question. So in, in the past, FCL we we looked at different uh, technologies, um, district cooling, but also uh, new forms of uh, desiccant dehumidification and cooling systems, decentralized systems, and and um, different technical combinations. And we basically built the models to do so. In, and at the end, it's it's these models or these systems influence the demand, right? So ideally, we we integrate these technologies to get a, an idea what would the end demand of cooling to be provided uh, need to be. And in this case, um, we're more looking more on the supply side. So um, it is for the energy systems design. I could imagine that we look into different. Um, conversion systems and different uh, technologies that pro provide cooling. At the end, it would trickle down to, to a certain demand or a demand curve that we need to fulfill with photovoltaics. So probably will be part of the modeling explicitly on those technologies is probably not the, the shift. Um, it's more about technologies that are available or very close to available. I mean, the technology you are addressing is, is still, I would say pretty much in a research state. Um, and it, it's, it's very promising, it's very interesting, um, but directly we will most likely not address it, but we will be very aware and careful what is happening on, on the cooling system side, because that obviously influences the entire demand. Thank you. Super. Next we've got Jiang Nan Chu. Please go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi. Hi, thanks for sharing. Uh, I got one question uh, on the solar targets. So Singapore has set a rather ambitious target. So by 2030, two gigawatt peak. So can you share some of the um, insights on how basically the, the country is uh, planning to do that? And uh, at the same time, uh, challenges and opportunities. Thanks. Um, yeah, I would like to know that. Uh, I would be happy if I could provide you an answer uh, with this. Um, and uh, I've read the targets and I, I read the, the green plan and uh, we've been in Singapore for a while. And uh, it's remarkable how there has been a shift in mindset towards uh, photovoltaic installations. And that is very clearly documented in both the PV roadmap as well as in the green plan. How the different uh, stakeholders come in, that is also for us a question we need to find out. Um, Obviously, um, public entities, um, for example, HDB, um, will have an, an easier say, I would say, to distribute solar versus uh, private stakeholders and private owners. But eventually, the motivation might even be even more on the, the private owner side. But to be very honest, um, which share each stakeholder group will have in this, this is to be investigated. Um, so I, I don't have a, a clear answer to that. And with our colleagues, um, uh, from NUS, we hope we can shed more light on that. Brilliant, thank you. Danielle Griego, you've got a question for Marcus. It looks like to be the closing question. Yes, and uh, thank you both for your uh, for your talks today. It was nice to yeah see updates and um, yeah some some background for what you've been doing. I had a specific question, especially related to this electricity consumption. Uh, study which you uh, mentioned, Marcus. So the cell phone data that you collected in Senegal, you showed that there were some trends that matched the electricity consumption. And I was just curious to see what, so how robust or how large your database was for that particular uh, study to form, I would say maybe a correlation. I'm not sure if this I, I see that type of trend as being more trend matching than correlations, unless and perhaps you had a really large database uh, for that. And then, so on top of that, just to see how that could be potentially extended to different types of locations, because Senegal, they probably do have very different use types and, and building typologies. So that might only be relevant for certain building 
applications or, or use types. So I was just wanting to ask a bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, so thanks for the question. So yeah, so um, this was really like a, an initial preliminary study. And um, so we had electricity consumption data with an hourly resolution and we had mobile phone data with an hourly resolution from the same year. Uh, so this was all provided within the, uh, there was a data for development challenge organized by, by Orange Labs in collaboration with the uh, Singapore uh, data provider. So we didn't collect data by ourselves, basically, right? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so what's actually uh, important, I think what, what you mentioned is that this correlation between number of people present during a given time and the uh, energy demand is, is obviously highly also dependent on the activity that takes place there, right? So in the, in the, in the one extreme, you have like residential, purely residential areas and, 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 and people perform their activities in their homes. So we, we would expect and you would see a high correlation, whereas in other areas like industrial areas, for instance, where you have like just big machine, it doesn't really matter whether you have like 10 people there, or nobody, or 10,000. It's really like this, this big machine that is really uh, basically dominating the energy demand. So yes, so this has to be very much uh, extended with additional data to become uh, applicable in a more comprehensive way. Uh, so really to, to be extended not only with the presence of people, but really also with the, with the activities that are taking place at different locations. And this is also, is, is, it was perhaps less critical uh, for the Senegal study, but it's, it's, I assume it's more critical in a dense city like Singapore, where, where you really have different uh, activities uh, interwoven with each other in, in different locations. So. This is why I mentioned at the, at the beginning, you know, that, that we, we, we have different types of data, but we also have like different approaches such as machine learning can certainly help to identify those driving factors behind the, the energy demand. This is something we try to explore also in this project. But it was, it was mostly to illustrate the approach, right? That we, we really um, combine knowledge about human activity patterns in space and time uh, with the uh, energy demand uh, in space and time. Okay, great, thank you. Super, thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Marcus. So thank you all for the additional effort to stick with us to the end. This is just uh, exactly what we want is more uh, interaction like this. So again, thank you to both Professor Schluter and to Professor Schlepfer. This is really, uh, setting us up for the third, which will be the next interaction, as we mentioned, and you'll be receiving some notification about when that will be. And uh, we wish you all a lovely lunch or dinner. Meanwhile, depending on which time zone you're in, good energy to you all with the good work you have at hand. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks, Marcus, for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.